This is now lecture seven in the series of Logos and the Muse, a journey in mythical history from the Orthodox Christian perspective. So last week we began our discussion on the medieval synthesis. We looked primarily at the significance of Troy and why it was considered such a special, special city in medieval literature. Um, even Homer himself referred to Troy as holy. And we saw how many cultures connected the historical past to the Trojan refugees. And then we saw the importance of Troy when it came to St. Constantine and Helen and their stories. So now this week we turn to Alexander the Great and the role that he played in mythic history. So we connect his story backwards to Achilles and then forward to King Arthur and the story of the Grail and chivalry and then to one of our own saints. So Achilles is one of the greatest warriors of the heroic age and he is best known for fighting in the Trojan War. He fought on the side of the Greeks. His mother was a goddess, Thetis, a Nereid or a sea nymph. His father was Peleus, king of the Myrmidons. So as many of you know, his mother wanted to make him immortal. And according to Statius's the Achilleid, she dipped him into the river Styx, which the river Styx is in the underworld. And all of Achilles was submerged except for his heel. So in the early part of his life, he was also raised by the centaur Chiron. It taught him how to fight. This is where Achilles learned to be ferocious in battle. So in the Iliad, which we discussed a little bit in lecture four, we see the last year of the 10-year war with Troy. And Achilles spent most of his time sulking in his tent because he felt mistreated by Agamemnon. So ultimately sends him back into battle was the death of his good friend Patroclus. Now Patroclus was killed by Hector because he was wearing Achilles' armor. Hector thought he was killing Achilles. So this sent Achilles into a murderous red rage. He kills countless Trojans. He even beats a river. And then he seeks his revenge, killing Hector. The story goes that when he dies, by getting shot in the heel by one of Paris' arrows, his armor reached the status of relic. Even Odysseus and Ajax the Greater had a fallen out over who would keep Achilles' armor. Now, for centuries, his spear was preserved in the temple of Athena on the Acropolis of Phasales. So keep that in mind as we move on to Alexander the Great. <clears throat> so there's a historical Alexander, and then there's the Alexander of legend. So remember what we discussed back in the third lecture, in terms of things as a universal and mythical history, the difference between history and myth is mostly irrelevant. What matters is the meaning behind these stories. They get passed down and they shape cultures. So if you want something more historical, though, about Alexander the Great, read Plutarch or Arian. So even these, as I pre previously have mentioned, are subject to modern historians' scrutiny. So Arian, who's considered the most accurate, is even accused of hagiography. So the legendary material is found in many, many cultures, but the one that I'm going to be drawn primarily from is a Greek Alexander romance. But first, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we know historically that's not contested by historians. So Alexander stood in the above-mentioned temple of Athena in front of Achilles' spear, and he envisioned himself as a new Achilles. And there are some similarities. Uh, he was a Macedonian, which is part of Greece, and he was traveling east to fight, much like Achilles did, to fight the Trojans, but Alexander was fighting the Persians. And interestingly enough, he carried with him a copy of the Iliad into battle. So he really believed himself as another Achilles. So as I said before, the stories we tell ourselves, the stories we tell about ourselves and our place in the world truly do matter. 
Alexander is an example of that, how he carried the Iliad into battle, believing himself to be a new Achilles. These stories we tell ourselves really do shape our moral imagination. So his telling, his carrying the Iliad is telling. So Alexander, who is also becomes the sort of the son of God, wherever he conquers, he tries his best to be adopted or become part of the pantheon, or becomes he's believed to be part man and part God. He always tries to be adopted as a son of the God of whatever ruling of what God rules that land that he conquers. Now that we know is all historical. Now the legendary materials, what things get interesting with Alexander. I said there's many legendary tales of him throughout ancient and medieval cultures, much like flood stories, almost every culture has something about Alexander. But in the Greek romance, like I said previously, we'll be pulling some of this from. He's not really the son of King Philip, based on, that's based on actual history though. But he's the son of Nectanabo, which is an Egyptian magician who disguises himself as a god and gets Olympias, which is uh, Alexander's mother, pregnant. So this is already a hint that this is going to be a, a, a definitely a, a strange story that will unfold. So after all, now Alexander is a demigod. He is part man and part god in this story. So after Alexander had traveled to much of the known world and conquered much of the world, he arrives at the edge of the world. And something interesting happens. Which I'm going to just read from the text. <clears throat> and I quote, Then I began to ask myself again if this place was really the end of the world, where the sky touched the earth. I wanted to discover the truth. So I gave orders to capture two of the birds that lived there. There were many very large white birds, very strong but tame. They did not fly away when they saw us. Some of the soldiers climbed on the backs, hung on tightly, and flew off. The birds fed on carrion, with the result that a great many of them came to our camp, attracted by the dead horses. I captured two of them and ordered them to be given no food for three days. On the third day, I had something like a yoke structured from wood and had this tied to their throats. Then I had an ox skin made into a large bag and fixed it to the yoke and climbed in climbed in, holding two spears, each above about 10 feet long, with a horse's liver fixed to the point. At once the birds soared up to seize the livers, and I rose up with them into the air until I thought I must be close to the sky. I shivered all over because of the extreme coldness of the air, caused by the beating of the birds' wings. Soon a flying creature in the form of a man approached me and said, Oh, Alexander, you have not yet secured the whole earth. Are you not exploring, and now you're exploring the heavens. Return to earth as fast as possible, or you will become food for these birds. He went on, look down on the earth, Alexander. I looked down, somewhat afraid, and behold, I saw a great snake curled up in the middle, in the middle of the snake, a tiny circle like a threshing floor. Then my companion said to me, point your spear at the threshing floor, for that is the world. The snake is the sea that surrounds the world. Thus admonished by providence above, I returned to earth, landing about seven days' journey from my army. I was now frozen and half dead with exhaustion. Where I landed, I found one of the satraps who was under my command. Barring 300 horsemen from him, I returned to my camp. Now I have decided to make no more attempts at the impossible. <clears throat> so the story is an interesting one because depending on how one reads this, Alexander could be considered either a precursor to Christ or an Antichrist figure. So the Antichrist attempts to subjugate the whole world and ultimately rule like God. Alexander had conquered much of the world and had reached the end, and there was nowhere for him to go but upward to the heavens. However, God tells him that you've not secured the whole world yet, and yet you're trying to come up to heaven. 
So this is an act of hubris. To ascend where he's not allowed to go, where he's not allowed to be. We can also read this as a precursor to Christ, who truly united the world, conquered it in his death and resurrection. And he has ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father. That place is only truly reserved for the true Son of God and no one else. And there are sort of, and there are accounts also fascinating of Alexander who did accept Yahweh as the true God. So regardless of these tales being legendary, the stories of Alexander played an important role in terms of mythic history. So the first being this: the story of a king with an unusual birth that conquered the world, united under his name, and ascended to the heavens. This story helped pave the way for the coming of Christ. One can almost make this audacious claim that the legendary Alexander acted as sort of a forerunner to the Gentile world, much like St. John did for the Jews. And the second reason why Alexander is important for mythic history is that he also provided a model along with St. George as well, but we'll be talking about St. George another day, he provided a model for medieval knighthood. Which brings us to the second person, or the third person, I mean, is Arthur. So this is not a comprehensive study of King Arthur. I have not myself exhausted all the sources in the text, so I'm not even going to pretend to pretend that I'm an expert on King Arthur. But we're going to talk about Arthur because you cannot not talk about Arthur when you're talking about mythic history. He, he's just too large of a figure. So the earliest sources of Arthur are actually Welsh, not British. So there are dozens of Welsh poems that some date back as the 6th century or even possibly earlier, where Arthur is depicted as a warlord. And in some of these poems, he's also depicted as sort of a uh, folk figure. Now, one of these poems, which I was going to try to read, but there's way too many Welsh words in it, and I'm going to butcher the Welsh language, and I respect for the Welsh people, I'm not even going to try to read it. But the poem is this in a nutshell. <clears throat> so, it's a story of Arthur descending into the underworld. So, remember some of what we talked about last, last week, or actually two weeks ago now, was the stories of the underworld are very common in the old world. And we have one in the earliest part, early, early, oldest possible stories of Arthur, him going to the underworld. Now in the poem the, the, called the Prede on Nuven, nu, Nuiven, it's translated basically as the spoils of Anuven, or the spoils of the underworld. So Arthur travels to the Celtic underworld with, with three boats, uh, full of men or soldiers, but only seven of these people over him and seven return. So what exactly happened in this sort of sack of the underworld is open to speculation. Um, there's not much clue given within the poem, but all we do see is Arthur is one as a warlike character going to the underworld. Um, some scholars suggest that because this is possibly the earliest poem that is also sort of an initiation, much like Odysseus and Aeneas descend into the underworld, is Arthur's sort of initiation into greater things to come. Now, in the Mabinogian, which are also very, very old Welsh stories, contain many feats and adventures of Arthur, uh, one of them being him helping his cousin, Kowich accomplished dozens of seemingly impossible tasks, similar to Heracles accomplishing seemingly impossible tasks. And but Colwich wishes to win Olwyn. Now, however, in these stories, Arthur is pretty much just a peripheral character. Um, he doesn't really come center stage until we get to Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kings of Britain, which I read from last week a little bit, of the prophecy given to Brutus of Troy, but in Monmouth's history, the usual Arthurian tropes of like the round table and the grail cycle are not present yet. But Monmouth depicts Arthur as a great king that conquered 
much of the known world, very similar to Alexander conquering much of the known world. And eventually he ends up going to conquer Rome. And the precedence is because two other great English kings had already conquered Rome. Basinius being one, and Constantine the Great, as you remember from last week, Constantine came from New Troy, which was England, or London. So Arthur seeks to do the same thing, to conquer Rome. So perhaps Rome had occupied Britain, why this is such a fascination with the British people, of attacking Rome, or conquering Rome. Uh, or perhaps maybe it's just because the Britons were it's this sort of a coming in a, of age in, in terms of civilization, so their strife with Rome is similar to that just maybe of an adolescent in, uh, challenging their parents. But this is a recurring motif you see with some of the British heroes as conquering, trying to conquer Rome. So Arthur embodies this idea. He's also known as a warrior king that would eventually fight off the Romans. In this sense, he is sort of a messianic figure. Also, much like how the Jews believed the Messiah would free them from Roman hegemony. But the later the Grail myth is added to the Arthurian legend. It's also known as the Vulgate cycle, um, sometimes it's called the Lancelot Grail cycle, and it's added into the pre-existing Arthur myths and legends. But contrary to what a lot of people believe, Arthur himself is not the one who found the Grail, but it was Sir Galahad, who is a descendant of Joseph of Arimathea. So Galahad, along with Percival and Bors, find the Grail. So what many modern people forget is that there is a host in the chalice. So this is not like Indiana Jones' the Last Crusade or anything like Monty Python and the Holy Grail, which I'm trying my hardest to refrain from any of those jokes. But the cup that caught the blood of Christ at the crucifixion contained a Eucharistic wafer. And of course, us being Orthodox, um, we don't do the wafer. We have bread. But in the West, there was the wafer. So contained within the grail was a, was a host. And many modern people forget this, and they translate this incorrectly later. Many of the scholars translate this wrong. And they translate, I've heard, they sometimes translate, instead of translating to mass, they translate to feast sometimes. Um, and they forget that the Middle Ages was really a, was a Christian age. And part of the Arthur story was, is, is that is deeply Christian. So this is why the knights who had to find the grail had to be virtuous, worthy men. They were also all virgin knights. If they were not pure, not virtuous, they were not allowed to obtain the grail. There were many knights who traveled with these three men who were not considered worthy, Lancelot being one of them. But there's a lot of cool things that happen in the grail cycle, but this ultimate is about Arthur and not the grail cycle. So again, back to Arthur, we're going to look Fast forward to the end of his life. So in the end, towards the end, he, he engages with his arch nemesis, Mo, uh, Modred, <clears throat> and he ends up fatally wounded. According to Mallory's story, Sir Bedivere, the only other survivor than Arthur of this, of this last battle, is asked by Arthur to return Excalibur to the Lady of the Lake. Bedivere, Sir Bedivere disobeys twice, and Arthur knows this because he asks Sir Bedivere to say, what did you see when you returned the sword? He's like, oh, I didn't really see much of anything. He just stashed the sword somewhere, probably hoping to keep it for himself. And he knew he was lying because the third time when he finally succeeds and does what he was told to do by Arthur, the famous scene with the lady of the lake reaches her hand up and takes the sword, and he relays this back to Arthur, and he's like, okay, you did it this time. Well, I think interesting, though, that repetition of three chances to get this right, sort of, kind of I think, I mean, it kind of harkens back to Christ's betrayal by St. Peter, 
that ultimately he failed several times. But also another illusion of Arthur being sort of a type of Christ, uh, Christ figure um, is that as well. But also Arthur dies, and three ladies, um, one of them being Morgan Le Fay, one of his other nemeses, um, takes him to the mythical Avalon, where he dies. He is later buried, and on his tomb, it says, Here lies Arthur, the once and future king, which is what the T.H. White book is named after. So this is why many believe that King Arthur will, will return one day. And this returning king motif reflects this eschatological reality that one day ultimately Christ will return. So we re- all, like I mentioned a few weeks back that in the Apocalypse of Pseudomothodius, we see about the return of the king of the Romans before Christ returns. There's also legends of Charlemagne who will one day return. And there's existed a legend within, within our own tradition. It's the last emperor of Constantinople, Constantine the Ninth Paleologos, who instead of dying during the sack of Constantinople, was rescued by an angel and turned into marble. He's known as the marbled king, and he was hidden beneath the golden gate of Constantinople. And he's believed that God will return him to life one day so he can conquer both the city and bring the old empire to its previous glory. But what do all these stories tell us about returning kings? They share one thing in common, and that they will return to conquer the enemies of Christ, which you should prepare for Christ's return. So the legend of King Arthur, can be the legend of Alexander the Great, is important here because it sets sort of the boundaries of what's acceptable that the king will do. Because if it's fulfilled incorrectly, there will be more of an anti-Christ figure, not a Christian king. So also from Arthur, we get was known as the chivalric romances, which sort of replaced the medieval epic, which replaced the ancient epics so as a literary genre. And we also get to see the code of chivalry. This comes in full bloom in the Arthurian cycle. So as I mentioned before, Alexander the Great provided a sort of prototypical model of medieval knighthood, and this was taken up within King Arthur. So I'm going to read to you the chivalric code because I find this is fascinating. Believe the church's teachings and observe all the church's directions. Defend the church. Respect and defend all weakness. Love your country. Do not recoil before an enemy. A single coward could discourage an entire army. Even the knights knew death was near, they would rather die fighting than show weakness. Show no mercy to the infidel. Do not hesitate to make war with them. Perform all duties that agree with the laws of God. Never lie or go back on one's word. Be generous to everyone and always and everywhere be right and good against evil and injustice. Now the chivalric code was more common in Western Europe, but we do have some of this tradition within the East as well. There's currently the Order of St. George, which is in existence still, which is a, a basically a, a, uh, a chivalric order, um, which has knights and everything, and it's an orthodox order. But also to live by these codes is not really the worst thing at all because most of these just can be reduced down to the classic virtues. And it gives us something to aim for, a higher ideal in which to live by. Now, of course, not all these are pertinent to us as the way they were during the medieval age. You know, we may need to spiritualize the whole show no mercy to the infidel. We can possibly translate as, you know, show no mercy to our, our, to our passions. Um, we're not knights, and so we're not going to go into battle with, you know, the infidel. That doesn't do so well in the modern age. But they're, I think they're important because it kind of helps us, um, gives us something to aim for 
Um, there's nothing wrong with defending the church and doing what is good and keeping your word. Now, the last figure I want to talk about is St. Alexander Nevsky. <clears throat> As we know, there's a pattern here. We've got Achilles, Alexander, Arthur, and another, Achilles, another, uh, another Alexander. Lots of A's. <laughs> Would you like to name this the A-team lecture? So, um, so St. Alexander Nevsky... 13th century warrior and military leader. He was the grandson of the Grand Prince Vladimir. Alexander was known for his defeat of Russia's enemies. He defended Novgorod from the Teutonic Knights and protected Russia from the Golden Horde. So in this sense, he plays a similar role to his namesake Alexander the Great, who defeated the Persians, while Nevsky faced the Mongols. And what I find fascinating is that he had an image of Alexander the Great on his helmet. So he really saw himself as, an, as a type of Alexander the Great. Of course, this coming through the Middle Ages, so it would be more of that uh, medieval understanding of who Alexander was, that idea of that model of knighthood. So the pattern, though, of the great warlords defending the lands from barbarians is, is, is relatively common trope in pre-modern literature. But what he does differently is, though, instead of actually going to war with the Mongols, he humbly submitted to them to save Russia from ruin, because the Mongol horde was a massive horde. He did what was very similar to Saints Boris and Glebe, who also chose to be humble warriors instead of killing heedlessly. So the Christian knight and Christian kings did not want to kill heedlessly. They did not want to go into battle unless they really, really had to defend their lands, to defend the people, to defend the church. And we see this in St. Alexander of Nevsky. He was cautious. He was a warrior when needed to be, but when it, the better option was to save the Russian lands from basically being just destroyed by the Mongol horde, he submitted humbly. He's considered a great hero still to this day. We have a tropar, and I will read this to you now. Christ revealed you, O blessed Alexander, as a new and glorious worker of wonders, a man and prince well-pleasing to God, and divine treasure of the Russian lamb. Today we assemble in faith and love to glorify the Lord by joyously remembering you. He granted you the grace of healing, and therefore entreat him to strengthen your suffering spiritual children and to save all Orthodox Christians. So the question is always one of these, is what is it, why is this pertinent to us? Why are we discussing these topics? So kingship and knighthood, I want to talk about specifically. So we're discussing these two things for a couple of reasons. So the first one is that we are called to be warriors, and we forget this. In the baptism rite, the priest prays over the person, or if you're an adult or an infant, if it's being baptized as an infant, he prays this. He that has put on you, O Christ, with us bows his head unto you. Ever protect him, a warrior invincible against them who vainly raise up enmity against him, or as might be against us. In our baptism, we are entered into sort of the soldiery, the soldiery, the army of Christ. The second reason we're discussing this today is that in our chrismation, we are anointed to be kings, priests, and prophets. We, we forget these things. We are enlisted into the people of God, the church militant, in our baptism. We are at war with our passions, and we do battle with the demons. We need to look more often to say, St. George, the dragon slayer, as a model for spiritual warfare. 
at the same time, we need to remember that we are anointed as kings, you too, ladies, as kings, to rule over and to order the part of creation that you have been given as a steward. Mostly, we must rule over our passions and to align our will with God's will so that we can be reordered, purged, illumined, and our news uh, cleansed. So a noose acting as the eye of the soul or the gate. So the ascetic struggle is a difficult path. That not only those who are willing to endure the battle will survive to the end and enter into paradise. But Father Alexander Smemon tells us that the kingship of Christ, we must remember this, is that of the crucified king. This is a crucial difference because we sometimes have these lofty ideas about going to the epic battle with demons and swinging our sword around but this is spiritual delu- can be <laughs> spiritual delusion our kingship is one of the crucified king we fight our battle by taking up our cross and dying to ourself this is the heart of the orthodox christian spiritual warfare So in this lecture, we looked at warriors and kings of the past, some from the pages of legend and myth, some actual historical figures that have been enveloped within legend, such as Alexander. Stories such as these can help us form our moral and spiritual imagination. And look at history a little more differently, look at the world a little more differently, in more an enchanted way. We must be as ferocious as Achilles with our passions, Yet be humble enough to know when we ascended past our ability like Alexander the Great. We are called to royal kingship from birth like Arthur. We must strive to live virtuously to defend the church and to fight alongside our brothers and sisters in Christ and to die valiantly and to be like St. Alexander of Nevsky knowing that sometimes it is best humbly to submit to the horde of the enemies at the gates to prevent further bloodshed. We are to be warriors in this battle against the enemies of the church, those demonic beings who seek to destroy us and destroy creation. We must rule over what has been given to us and do it all for the glory of God.